praise the Lord. How good it is to sing praises to our God. How pleasant and fitting to praise him. The Lord builds up Jerusalem. He gathers the exiles of Israel. He heals the brokenhearted and binds up their wounds. He determines the number of the stars and calls them each by name. Great is our Lord and mighty in power. His understanding has no limit. The Lord sustains the humble, but casts the wicked to the ground. Sing to the Lord with grateful praise. Make music to our God on the harp. He covers the sky with clouds. He supplies the earth with rain and makes grass grow on the hills. He provides food for the cattle and for the young ravens when they call. His pleasure is not in the strength of the horse, nor his delight in the legs of the warrior. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. This is the word of the Lord. Last week was Easter, and I think where we left it was, he is risen. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. What should we do? We should talk with Jesus, and we should listen for what Jesus has to say to us, at least. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. What should we do? At least we should talk with Jesus. We should listen for what Jesus has to say to us. And I don't know. uh, I I know many of us don't like to be told uh, what we should do. Uh, We find reasons why uh, shoulds shouldn't apply to us. Um, I I get that way. I feel that way myself uh, quite a bit. But if someone has come back from the dead, like if if we are, are, are really believing that story, then it's got to be worth the conversation. <laughs> Sometimes I'm, I'm struck by just you know, the reality of, of how, if you start talking with an out, outsider who's, who, who doesn't you know, uh, have, have any um, experience with church and you start telling them the story of what we believe in a virgin birth and God com- coming in the, in the form of a person and, and all that Jesus does and experiences and then death on the cross and then the resurrection, it's, it's, a, it's a really, it's a wild story. It's, 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 and then we're filled with the ghost of God uh, as, th- throughout our lives. It's, it's something that like, Wow, I, I, and then you start, li- but if you start listening to what other people, uh, all, like the stories they build their lives on, I want to tell you, no less wild, folks, no less wild. Um, and there's as much, <clears throat> I stand by this, there's as much historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus as many, many of the other events that we absolutely take for granted in our world. And, and this isn't going to be a historical uh, evidence for the resurrection of Jesus moment. But if anyone does want to get coffee and talk about the historical uh, evidence for the resurrection of Jesus, please, my email is caleb at trinitygracechurch.com. I seriously would love to get coffee with you, and not just for the coffee. Um, uh, we have offered, we have had uh, weeks where we've offered a lot of the, the historical evidence for the resurrection of Jesus. Um, and if you're not convinced by, by what I have to say, I can point you in the direction of, of so many resources that really examine that, that subject. But the, the, the fact of the matter is, is if you want to be intellectually credible on this, it's a lot harder to dismiss the evidence of the resurrection of Jesus than you might think. Um, Several researchers, journalists, academics have started projects, have started to write books to finally, once and for all, disprove the resurrection of Jesus and, and actually come to, to believe in the process. And for many, that evidence is really important. That is the gateway into belief for, for, for a lot of us. But there's another way that you can look into it. And not just examining in an academic way the his- historical evidence for a past event. Um, and I don't mean to be overly simple here, but you can talk with Jesus. <laughs> our, our, our hope, our Easter hope, our hope uh, of the resurrection of Jesus is not about simply verifying a past event. It's about experiencing the ongoing reality of that, of conversation with Christ, of a friendship 
with Jesus, if you could say that. If that like, maybe that makes you feel a little cringy inside, but, but that's what's on offer here is an actual friendship with God, that, that the living presence of God would not only surround us, but fill our lives and resurrect us, that in a very real way, we can participate in Jesus' life, death, and resurrection by his Spirit. I love how Ronald Rollheiser puts this. The resurrection is not just something that happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago and will happen to each of us sometime in the future after we die when our own bodies will be raised to new life. It is that, but it is much more. The resurrection is something that buoys up every moment of life and every aspect of reality. God is always making new life and undergirding it with a goodness, graciousness, mercy, and love that in the end heals all wounds, forgives all sins, and, bring de- and brings deadness of all kinds to new life. If we are celebrating Easter, ongoing, here we are in Easter tide. And in our culture, we're so good at building up to an event like Christmas, and then the day happens, and the next day it's like it's completely over. And, and yet the, 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 the saints of the church and, and, the, and the history of the church have said, no, 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 we can't forget Christmas tide. We're going to live in the joy of incarnation for, for, for weeks to come. And, and Easter, it's not just a one-day celebration. It's, it's, it, we're in Easter tide now where we're, we're working out the implications of the resurrection of Jesus in our lives what does it look like to live the resurrection to pray the resurrection the resurrection is not just something that happened to Jesus 2,000 years ago it's a reality we're invited to participate in it our, our life becomes a prayer and that's not just for some special class, super elite spiritual person, all of our lives become a prayer, become a talking and listening to God, becoming a sensing of God's presence, become, become, become worship. If you just go through, just like if you literally flip over in the Gospels and find the resurrection story in each of the four of them and then trace the people who meet with Jesus right after the resurrection, the talking and listening is what transforms everything. It's, it's this, their life becomes a prayer. Those moments are prayer moments. Mary Magdalene. The apostle to the apostles. The first person to tell of the resurrection of Jesus. How does she begin? She begins by mistaking Jesus for being the gardener. And there's all kinds of metaphorical significance to her mistaking Jesus for being the gardener because of course God is the gardener in the grand story. But it's not until she, her, she hears Jesus say her name. She talks with him. And what happens? Her eyes are open. And the grief that was crushing her as she walked to the tomb that morning is transformed into joy. Beauty for ashes. A garment of praise for your heaviness. Through what? Talking and listening. <laughs> Peter was an absolute erratic mess, buried in the the shame of his denial. He's lost a race with the apostle John to the tomb. He's devastated in many ways. And it's in talking and listening to Jesus after the resurrection that his life is reassembled. It's put back together. Stronger than before and Jesus entrusts him to be the, the rock that he was initially called to be. Jesus goes through quite a bit of extensive theater to recreate the moments of Peter's denial so that he can rebuild and rehabilitate his heart. But it is in talking and listening to the resurrected Jesus that Peter is transformed. Thomas. We, we know him as Doubting Thomas, even though that's not the best nickname for him because he's full of a lot of faith through a lot of the story, but he gets his reputation from a few moments of not believing his friend's account that they had encountered Jesus resurrected from the dead. And he says, enough is enough. I have to see for myself. And I, I know a lot of you can carry that same mentality. Enough is enough. I don't want to just hear from you. I want to experience myself. And then he does. He talks and listens to Jesus. He puts his fingers in the wound. There's a couple that is uh, recounted in Luke's gospel that is um, on the road to Emmaus. They're leaving Jerusalem. They're dejected. They're confused. Um, And they talk with this man as they're leaving town who's sort of like, this is Jesus doing theater again. He pretends not to know what's going on. You just picture him walking along beside them. He's like, what are you guys talking about? 
And they go on to tell him, have you, where have you been? Have you been living under a rock? Do you not know about what's been going on? And they recount to him. And, and, and this stranger walking with them begins to unpack the story for them and help them see from the scriptures actually what is uh, weighing you down with agony and grief and confusion is actually part of the plan and has been from the beginning. And when they finally get to the end of their journey, they invite him to stay with them and he comes in for a meal and it's in the breaking of bread that they finally recognize him and then he's gone. And as they recount their time with him, as their hope was recovered, and they say, as we were talking, did our hearts not burn? Did our hearts not burn? That's one of my favorite phrases in the New Testament. Jesus Christ is risen from the dead. What should we do? We should talk with Jesus. We should listen for what Jesus has to say to us. That sounds great. The reality is for many of us, we find prayer, which is talking and listening to God, challenging. Uh, we, we struggle to get started. Um, we struggle to keep it going. Many of us struggle to make it a regular part of our day. If we're honest, there's a lot of Christians who find prayer really boring difficult to concentrate. Um, many of us feel like we don't pray very well, and that's, that's on our own in interior monologue to God, but also uh, we don't pray very well, especially out loud to other people. We, many of us wish we prayed more. And, and, and we're actually going to have uh, a, a longer conversation in this Eastertide series on the obstacles to prayer in our lives. And so I'm not going to get into all of them right now. But, but one thing that I think is a challenge from my experience is that many of us have a primary way that we think about prayer that is basically like eyes closed spiritual improv. The picture we have of what prayer is, is that I close my eyes and fold my hands and then just flow with, with like everything pouring out in, in, in never ending sentences. And you know, like there's kind of like, you sort of hear people with a prayer language and we're like, I don't have that and that sounds weird, but that's what, that, that's what it is, right? The, the example many of us have for reference in our heads is someone just launching into a spontaneous monologue to God and the, the thoughts are streaming and they just flow. The reality is for many of us, that's very, very hard to do. Have you ever taken an improv class? It's like anxiety inducing, right? It's very difficult. Like some of you are made for it and we know. <laughs> but for many of us, we don't, know, we, we, we don't know what to say. We don't know how to start. And so, so what happens because of that is we really only find ourselves praying when life gets so bad or so challenging or so tragic or so stressful that all of a sudden we drop the pretense and we don't care anymore what we sound like and so we just launch in. And so some of you, the, the, the deepest moments of prayer in your life have been really intensely tragic or grief stricken or stressed out or, or, or desperately depressed or you know, anxious moments because we just, I don't care anymore. But in our regular day to day, Improv, spiritual improv with our eyes closed is challenging. And it can be hard to keep it going long form. We know, we know that some are suited for it, but it's not, I want to tell you this. If you struggle with that, it's not the only way to pray. It's really important to, to remember that that's not the only way to pray. That if you're not good at closing your eyes and monologuing to God for one hour unceasing, you're not alone and that's not the only way to pray. And so if you're like, I'm never going to sign up for this prayer, prayer room thing that you guys are, are, are doing because I could never pray for an hour. I want to tell you, almost everyone who went into that prayer room this, this 24 hours felt that way. And, and almost all of them described getting to the end of the hour and not being ready to leave. Because we have to realize there are so many different other ways to pray. And we have this deep, deep well of, of people who've come before us and people from different cultures and, and the church's story across the ages to draw from, to learn how to pray. This is not, the, the, the eyes closed spiritual improv, that's not the only way Jesus prayed. As a matter of fact, in Jesus' most trying moments, if you were to describe the most trying moment of Jesus' life, he's hanging on the cross. And when Jesus is hanging on the cross, he prayed two psalms. <laughs> They came out of his mouth. My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? And into your hands I commit my spirit. 
Jesus praying on the cross, and what is he praying? Psalm 22 and Psalm 36. That's really important. In Jesus' most trying moments, he wasn't just spiritually improving to the Father. He's praying a pre-written prayer that he had grown up soaking in. There, there, there's, there's quite a bit of evidence in Jesus' life, if you want to track the times that Jesus mentions the Psalms, that Jesus' life is very evidently soaked in the prayer book of Israel, soaked in the Psalms. That means he wasn't just improv all the time when he prayed. Now, we know Jesus got up early in the morning and, and went away, and they were looking for him, and they would find him praying. And so surely he knew how to pour out what, if anyone could improv, it would be Jesus, right? But he also prayed these previously written prayers in crucial moments of his life. In fact, when Jesus has to teach his disciples to pray, they come to him, they've been watching his life, and they don't say, show us how to do miracles. They don't say, show us how to expound on Torah like you do. They don't say, show us how to speak with authority. They don't say, show us how to walk on water or feed the masses. They say, teach us to pray. And when he begins to teach them to pray, he doesn't just give them a, a, a prayer that he's making up on the spot. He adapts a, a, a prayer that they would have grown up praying in the synagogue, in the temple called the Kadesh. We learn to pray by praying other prayers. And, and by praying the prayers that we find in the scripture. And there's no uh, deeper, richer, more full resource for learning how to pray than the Psalms. And we know Jesus soaked in this resource, that Jesus marinated in the reality of this resource. And that it come, in the moments where he's most squeezed, it is what comes out of him. My most normal uh, routine of prayer uh, each morning. Um, or if I miss a morning, the next morning, uh, begins in the Psalms. It's a part of my, my daily readings, and many times I don't get further than the morning psalm. Because what the morning psalm does its job, it gets me praying. And that's the reason I, 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 I pulled up in the first place, was to really interact with God, not just to check off that I did these readings. And so a lot of times the morning psalm will get my heart moving in the direction of prayer, and then I'm journaling, and then I'm praying, and that, that takes, and I never get to the Old Testament reading or the Gospel reading. Some days I do. Our vision as a church this year is to expand our prayer life. What we're, what we're saying is, what does that look like? It's for every person in Trinity Grace Church to talk and listen to God every day. If that's already a part of your life, to see that deepen and grow and expand. If, if that's never been a part of your life, to just try in the smallest way to begin talking and listening to God. And I want to tell you, the Psalms are a tremendous resource for getting that going in your life. Eugene Peterson reminds us in many places in his writings that when we pray, we're joining a conversation, and that's so important. <laughs> like, our, our, our God is, um, our, our God is not just a being of static power. We say this all the time. Our God is a God in community, Father, Son, Holy Spirit. That means in the very nature of God is relationship, is love, and the very center of Trinity is conversation. So it's, the pressure is off of you to start and sustain the conversation with your spiritual improv monologue. It's already going on and it's something that you can enter in. Here's what Peterson says about praying the Psalms. The great and sprawling university that Hebrews and Christians have attended to learn to answer God, to learn to pray, has been the Psalms. More people have learned to pray by matriculating in the Psalms than, it, than in any other way. The Psalms are the prayer book of Israel. They're the prayer book of Jesus. They are the prayer book of the church. At no time in the Hebrew and Christian centuries, with the possible exception of our own, have the Psalms not been at the very center of all concern and practice in prayer. If you want to start talking and listening to God at any point, as a beginner or as a hundred-year-old saint, you can open the Psalms and get going. They're, they're, they're a place to put words in your mouth until you have words of your own. And the beauty is that they encompass like this full range of the human experience. Our, our full emotional life is represented in this 150 uh, songs. So I, I wanted to choose today uh, as our teaching text, not, not just like, so, something handpicked on prayer. I just wanted to pick one out of, of the weekly readings from this week. So Psalm 147 was the morning psalm earlier in the week. And then I opened today and it's the psalm for this morning. 
Someone's helping us, folks. So um, th- just to get unbelievably practical, there's different ways that you can do this. But I just wanted to show you this. is this, I, I've used Lexio 365 before. I've used the Bible in a year app. I've had times where I wasn't using anything and I'd just pick up the Bible. But this is what I use um, right now uh, d- daily. It's the Book of Common Prayer Daily Office Lectionary. And it's an app that you can find in the App Store. And this is the design. Isn't it stunning? <laughs> like teams of people worked on this. And I mean, it's just... If that doesn't make you want to get it, I don't know what will. But when you open it, look how mind-blowing it is inside. Show them the inside. (laughs) Guys, we're praying here, okay? This is the readings for today. So there's a morning psalm, there's an evening psalm, there's an Old Testament reading, there's a New Testament reading and a gospel. If you do all the readings, depending on your reading speed, you're looking at like 12 to 15 minutes, but the reality is it's to get us to a place where we're, we're communing with God, where we're talking and listening to God. And many, many mornings, I don't get past the morning psalm because that gets me, gets me praying. I, I was going to bring up and show you my, my journal, but th- this is how I do it. And you'll, you'll find your own practice. I write the date at the top of the page. I write the readings that I get from the app. Then I turn the phone off and then I throw the phone softly onto the couch far enough away that I would have to get up to get it. And I say, do not get up to get it. Leave the phone. God, help me leave the phone. And then I'm into it. I'm praying. And you start to, you start to saturate uh, meditate, be, be formed by these psalms. And, and, and one of the wild things that they do is they let you realize you can say some things to God that you would have never thought you could say. Like, I'll tell you, there's some wild stuff in there. And, and, and I, I think, we're going to talk about this a little bit later, but I think it's really important to know, like, the wild stuff that's in there. Like, this is the scripture, right? We believe the scripture is true and authoritative for life and practice. How can this person be asking that their enemy's children be smashed on the rocks? What? But have you ever ridden the train at, at rush hour? Okay, never mind. Have you ever like been betrayed at a core level? <laughs> like, and, and what you're really feeling there, you're like, I have to get rid of this feeling before I come to God. <laughs> and, and the Psalms say, no way. Actually bring that feeling of betrayal. Bring that feeling of anxiety. Bring that desire for revenge. Bring that like anger and start there. Start praying where you really are. And the Psalms show us they don't, they don't sanctify the worst impulses of our heart, but they say the way they would be changed is in the presence of God. Not you working it out on your own and then coming to God. The Psalms show us pray your real heart. Pray your real experience. Pray your real life. Like the, the little titles of the, of the Psalms are, are wild. Uh, some of them like, uh, are like, this is when David pretended to be insane in front of Ambimelech. And you're like, what? You go back and read the story and like, and he was praying this? Wow. Jonah. In the, Jesus said, they came and asked Jesus for a sign. And he'd been doing a lot of signs and he's a little frustrated with them. He says, no signs for you. The only sign is going to be the sign of Jonah. Jonah spent three days in the belly of a whale and then was spit out. It's a wild story, let's be honest. You know what Jonah prayed in the belly of the whale? Not a spiritual monologue prayer. Not not spiritual improv. He prayed the Psalms. Go back and look at the prayer. He prayed what he had been most saturated in throughout his life. Jesus on the cross prays the Psalms. Whatever you and I are facing, we can pray the Psalms. Dr. Ellen Davis uh, has this tremendous book. She's a distinguished professor from Duke Divinity. Uh, She's written this tremendous book called Getting Involved with God that moves through different ways of of interacting with Yahweh through the Old Testament. And she has this chapter on praying the full range of the Psalms. I've come back to it so many times. It's underlined and highlighted to death. Um, And she says this, the Psalms model ways of talking to God that are honest yet not obvious they are not obvious at least they are not obvious to modern Christians they may guide our first steps towards deeper involvement with God because the the Psalms give us a new possibility for prayer they invite full disclosure they enable us to bring our conversation with God uh, the, the, the feelings and thoughts that most of us think we need to get rid of before God will be interested in hearing from us 
The point of the shocking psalms is, we said this, right? Not to sanctify what is shameful. For example, the desire for sweet revenge or to make us feel better about parts of ourselves that stand in need of change. Rather, the psalms teach us that profound change happens always in the presence of God. Over and over they attest to the reality that when we open our minds and hearts fully to God who made them, then we open ourselves, whether we know it or not, to the possibility of being transformed beyond our imagining. It's in God's presence that we scrape it out and put it before him. I I get worked up about this because praying the Psalms has been the, like, maybe the most important spiritual practice in my life. Um, you guys, I feel like, have heard all of my stories, and so for some of you, this is going to be a very fast review, um, but like, w- what we need is each other's stories, and, and t- to hear ha- how we all like, lean on, on, on this reality, but I spent a summer in China after college, and uh, b- before and after, I was wrestling with really intense anxiety to the point of having multiple panic attacks a day. And so I didn't know how to talk about this with people. It was a tremendously isolating time because I felt like I was crazy. When you have thoughts racing in your brain that you can't stop, it makes you feel like maybe I'm crazy and I don't know how to to stop it. And so I didn't know how to talk about it with people. And then it would happen and it would be in the midst of other things happening and I couldn't always just run away and be by myself. And so I had to find a way of talking with my friends about this anxiety that would come crashing into my mind as we were moving along. So we, we came up with a code and I would say the dog Dogs are barking. You can come up with your own code, but this one works. You can say the dogs are barking, and it meant that I was starting to feel really tremendously anxious. So they would pray for me, and then they would also know that if I slipped off somewhere, it was because the dogs were barking, and and I would pray. And and I had this folded copy of Psalm 34 in in my pocket during those days, and I I would fold it and unfold it until it was absolutely worn out, and I prayed Psalm 34 (laughs) over and over and over and over and over and over and over again to try to rest, like to try to be rescued in the middle of panic attacks and anxiety. And I was on a, I was, Alice and I were starting a relationship and we had like two phone calls that entire summer. And I remember talking to her about this anxiety and I started to tell her about Psalm 34 and I realized I knew the entire psalm. It had just, it it was like this lifeline for me and it had gotten imprinted on my heart. Many of you will have heard me share that, that um, when we were first married, I had a job at, at a mega church in South Florida, and there were opportunities for uh, promotion there. Um, and, and then we came to New York City on our honeymoon. The other option was going, to, going straight to seminary. And we came to New York City on our honeymoon, and this idea began to stir in our hearts that maybe God was inviting us to, to move to New York. And it was the most absurd of the three options we were considering in our lives, and it didn't seem responsible, and we didn't have jobs. Literally, when I moved in with my Tibetan landlords in Queens, it was absolutely on a handshake and we had lost four other apartments because we didn't have jobs and, and landlords just really like you to have a job they're just so into that the consistent income is a big thing for them but before we moved, I was, I was going through the Psalms that, that, that year, and I came to Psalm 105, and Allison was asleep. We were in a Motel 6 on the way to go see her parents in, in, uh, on the west coast of Florida, and I was reading the Psalms, and, and I came across this passage. When they were f- but few in number, this is recounting Israel going from slavery in Egypt to the promised land. When they were, when they were but few in number, few indeed, and strangers in it, they wandered from one nation to uh, from, one, from nation to nation, from one kingdom to another. He allowed no one to oppress them. For their sake he rebuked kings. Do not touch my anointed ones. Do my prophets no harm. Now that's about Israel. That's not about me. But the Holy Spirit spoke to my heart as I was, I was reading that psalm and said, I will protect you. I will go with you. There are authorities and powers and things that were, uh, you're way outnumbered and I will be with you if, you if you will make this move. And I remember scrawling in my journal, we are moving to New York and then passing out in Shalom. And Allison wakes up and finds my journal open and says, oh, oh really, are we? So she had to get her own psalm. We'd been living here for a few years and I had, you know, like made some attempts to, uh, to I didn't really know what to do. I had done some auditions because I had a theater background. I had helped uh, a church in Connecticut with music. I was finally hired uh, at a church in Manhattan. I had become, uh, I was doing teaching with them and they were going to help us plant a church in Brooklyn. And I was like, finally, the story is happening. The thing that we were initially called for is, is getting going. I can't, I actually can't believe that this is happening. And then that church hit a financial wall. I got called in for my Tuesday meeting and they said, 
said, listen, your, your position here, we can't financially support it anymore. You can stay on if you want to raise your own funds. And I was like, that's like getting fired. And uh, we're not going to move forward with the, the church plant in Brooklyn. And it was like the legs were cut out from under me. And I walked out of there just like, ugh. And I remember in that season, like desperately looking for help. And I, I came across Psalm 25. These numbers are important to me, 34, 105, 25. Because it became another lifeline, another way of, of just praying out my desperate need for God's rescue and help. And then God began to lift my spirits before he began to lift my circumstances. That's one of the things praying the Psalms will do for you. I'm not going to go on with a million stories, but maybe just a couple more. We started fundraising for this church in, in Brooklyn in 2008. Anyone remember anything happening in 2008 financially? A little bit devastating of a time to be going around asking other people for money. And I remember we got down, I, I was w with my, our first worship leader, Zach, and we went down, we were staying with his, his family outside of Atlanta. We we're going to go to his home church and, and ask them if they would support us. Um, and they were going to say no, but I didn't know that yet. Um, and I remember sitting on the front porch and I opened up the lectionary for the day. And guess what psalm was in there? 105. And I was like, what? I know this psalm. This is why I moved to New York. And here I am about to raise funds. And then I read the section just down from the part that God had used to call us to New York. And it says, he called down famine on the land and destroyed all their supplies of food. And he sent a man before them, Joseph, who had what they needed, basically, is, is the summary. He tells the story of Joseph there. And I just felt deep in my heart, God said, hey, I've been with you this whole time. I've sent people ahead of you that, that are going to surprise you, really, that have the resources that you need. And we went to our home churches and asked them for funds. And, and I love them, but they said no to us. And just a few months after reading that on Zach's front porch, a church that I wasn't aware of any connection with made a six-figure commitment to our church getting started. I had to write all these documents. You're starting a new organization to the people who are funding it. What type of church are you going to start? And <laughs> I'm not making this up. Psalm 105 was in the lectionary again. They, they repeat the Psalms. Um, and the first five verses describe the type of church that I wanted to be a part of. And it, it's, a, it's like the seeds of the vision of our church, presence, formation, and love are, are in Psalm 105. And God's like, this guy needs some direct help. We're going to show him the same thing over and over again. I, I go back to these prayers like old friends now. And I just want to invite you to that. I want to invite you to, to, I have celebratory moments where I was like with 10 congregations gathered in Manhattan of Trinity Grace Church at, at, this, at the height in 2016 of us all being together and praying like the Lord is my salvation. Whom shall I fear? Psalm 27. I have my own pastoral formation from Psalm 1 about I want my life to be like this tree planted by streams of water that's nourished in season and out. That's leaf doesn't wither. How do I do that? I do it by meditating meditating on God's word day and night by talking and listening back to God. So Psalm 47 was just, just in there this week, twice. And it's a psalm that's kind of all over the place. <laughs> like the psalmist is like, you can see like he's sort of like, I mean, the, he's just, his brain is, is everywhere. It's all, all across. And, and then he finally comes to this place in verse 11. The Lord delights in those who fear him, who put their hope in his unfailing love. Verses like that used to trip me up. Delights in those who fear him. Who is this God that wants people to be afraid? That's not, I, I don't think that's the, the best translation of, of, of what that means. The Lord's delight is in those who honor him, who have reverence for him, who, who have respect that they're not in control is basically, I think, what, what, what's getting at there. But who put their hope in his unfailing love. The Lord delights in those who honor and respect him and, and they put their hope in his unfailing love. Easter, if it does anything, it tells us that the love of God will not fail. And I want to say this to you. The Psalms reiterate this over and over again. The unfailing love of God is a pretty good foundation for prayer. 
When you're drawing near a God who's not fundamentally disappointed in you or wishing that you had been praying just a little bit more, but what you meet is unfailing love when you come to God in prayer. That's a pretty good conversation for talking and listening uh, or foundation for talking and listening. To know that God is always previous. God is already in conversation so you don't have to start it all and you don't have to sustain it all. We can join in and the Psalms open the door for us. There's kind of a... um, Ongoing conversation, ongoing debate about how change happens for human beings. Um, That there's a lot more to it than this. But basically, like, do we think our way into right acting? Or do we act our way into right thinking? And sometimes you'll hear, you know, pathways for transformation talked about in in both ways. Like, I have to have, uh, I have to learn something. I have to have new ideas so that I can begin new practices. And then those practices sort of become my my character over over time, right? Or I have to just begin doing stuff. And then it's through the doing, actually, that I I learn and discover. And I want to just say that there's a false dichotomy there. You can approach from absolutely both ways. You can approach from both directions, Praying the Psalms is a way to begin when you can't work out how to begin. And that makes it such a good starter. Because if you open up and you start to pray these prayers and you start to put their words in your mouth when you not, are not sure what words to put, to, to put towards God, then, then you get trained in this way of honest conversation. And if that's not enough, Jesus did it. And if that's not enough, they continually introduce us to the unfailing love of God. And they show us that we can bring our worst thoughts to God. I'll give you Eugene Peterson one one more time as we close. I need a language that is large enough to maintain continuities. Supple enough to maintain nuances across a lifetime that that brackets child and adult experiences. And courageous enough to explore all all the countries of sin and salvation, mercy and grace, creation and covenant, anxiety and trust, unbelief and faith that compromise the continental human condition. The Psalms are this large, supple, and courageous language. I don't want to give it away, but I had uh, a really tremendous experience in the prayer room (laughs) over Monday, Thursday into Good Friday. And uh, I wasn't trying to be heroic. I really waited for people to take the middle of the night hours. And then there just happened to be two as we were closing, like closing in on the deadline that weren't taken. So I was like, fine, I'll do 3 a.m. So you know when your alarm goes off for something, you're like, that's impossible. <laughs> There's no way that it's the time. And so I got up unbelievably grumpy, not spiritual at all. And I, and I made my way, like I, I, I live, you know, not that far. I Ubered over to the office. <laughs> People who know me are not shocked. And I got, I got out there and I start moving through, right? And we'd help set the room up, but I start moving through these pre-written prayers, and I start seeing many of your prayers on the wall and, and I begin to just sort of drop my guard and I begin to experience the presence of Jesus. And um, this doesn't happen to me all the time, but I went over to the communion station and I'm praying these pre-written prayers. Right? I'm not just improv And I just sense God's presence like, and I knelt down and as I was kneeling, I, I, I knelt on the rug that's in our office and the rug that's in our office is from my dad's company that he started and he started it from a mission trip to, uh, to Moldova to build a church. He has no construction ability whatsoever, no business on this trip um, and yet he was a good negotiator and so they put him in a motorcycle and a sidecar with this guy named Igor and he went into downtown Moldova and he negotiated for the supplies of this church to be built and from that he learned the inner workings of business there and started a company. This is all information that you don't need to know but as I drop down onto my knees, I see this rug of my father who's gone, who died suddenly at 50 and the verse the company is based on, it was 828 International Trading. Uh, God works all things together for good for those who love him and who are called according to his purpose and I just sank down And I was just like kneeling and then like absolutely in my imagination, but absolutely real. I just felt like the feet of Jesus walked right into my view. And I just put my arms around (laughs) and I'm just like overcome with a sense of God's presence. And I just felt like he just set set his hand on my back. It's like, I'm with you, son. And like, (laughs) there isn't anything better than sensing the presence of God in that way. And 
it's three in the morning and I, I didn't want to go and here I am. Like, and, I, and like all these threads being pulled together. And it didn't start because I was full of enthusiasm and ready to pray and drop to my knees and monologue to God for an hour. No, I needed the stations. I needed the pre-written prayers. And then Jesus just walked up and put his hand on my back. By the end, I was ready to write my own prayer. We were at, there's a station at the end to write your own psalm. And, and my heart's pouring out. I'm flipping past the pages of other people's hearts, pouring out to God. There's nothing better I could invite you to in, in experiencing the resurrection of Jesus than knowing that you can talk and listen to this God. And this God wants to hear from you wants to speak to you our vision as a church is to grow and expand in our prayer life not as a spiritual achievement but as a movement of love so I, week one of easter tide i want to invite you this week just to pray the psalms find a way to pray the psalms practice praying the psalms this week this is how to start in prayer Part one, pray the psalms and i want to tell you as you as you do that as you get into this resource May, like Mary, you hear your name called, right? Dropping to my knees in that room, it was like, here's my father and his story. Here's my story. Here's Jesus stepping towards me. Here's forgiveness of sins. Here's, here's I'm with you, son, Emmanuel. So many things pulled together in that thread. May it be like, as you pray the Psalms, may you hear your name called. And may you recognize the risen Lord. Like Peter, maybe you are carrying a burden of shame and it needs to be lifted. May it be lifted in the presence of God as you pray. Maybe you have doubts and you're confronted with them and burdened with them every day and you're like, I need to put my hands in the wounds. May you experience that as you pray. Maybe you're leaving town and it's like finally I'm feeling my heart burning again. As we were praying in this room right behind before the service, uh, one of the people we were praying with had a picture of God removing calluses. Just like hardened places. That we would be aware by the Spirit, oh, like I've just gotten really numb or really selfish or really dug into my own way. And, and may praying the Psalms this week just be a softening. Just be a movement of the Spirit to invite us into this resurrection life. Heavenly Father, I ask in the name of Jesus, you would move by your Spirit that you would grow us patiently and lovingly into a praying church. That it wouldn't just be something we should be doing and feel guilty about, but it would be a deep well, God, that we can come and drink from. God, and I know the Psalms are a deep well that we can come and drink from. And so I, play, I pray that many of us this week, today, would just go by for a dip, would go by for a drink, would, would, would experience the life, the living water of your word prayed these songs, these poems that we don't have to clean up before we come to you. I just pray there will be a profound sense of we can come to you as we are, that you are enough. In all the ways that we might not be enough, you are enough. Deep in our prayer life, in Jesus' name, amen.